It is November 30th, the final day of hurricane season 2022, and we thank you for joining us for this special wrap up. John Ryan, great to see you guys and you the Here. same. Thank glad you. it's in uh, under peaceful circumstances. Uh, yeah. I'm so glad, even though November, you know, was kind of busy, at least right now, it's not to end the season. Yeah, yep. and, and it is interesting always to get to that finish line, the official finish line as we benchmark it, the 30th of November. Yep. Some of the seasons come uh, roaring through some kind of crawl to a finish. Uh, we're thankful that at least here immediately in South Florida, we were for the most part spared, well, though we had some uh, very close calls. But for some, of course, it was a very bumpy season, and that includes two landfalls in the state of Florida. No, the state of Florida, unfortunately, uh, bore the brunt of, of, of a good portion of the season because not only did we have major Hurricane Ian as a Cat 4 with record-setting storm surge and, of course, inland flooding, which was also record-setting and quite terrible, but we also uh, had to deal with Nicole, a late-season hurricane which struck us. And, and, and this, by the way, this was a back-loaded hurricane season. The early part of the season, the first half, not much happened. Everything basically happened from September 1st on. And I don't mean literally everything, but almost everything from September 1st on. And there you see the tally for the year. You know, you look at that and you say, right, Ryan and Steve, you'd say, hey, normal season. But was it? Steve? Your first crack at that? Well, you know, I think back to a couple of things that were unique about this season. First of all, May did not have a named storm. Correct. And this is the first time in a while we didn't see one. So we got off to this slow start. And I remember getting to about Labor Day and people were like, OK, no big deal. We yeah. made it. But of course, <laughs> the worst was yet to come. Yeah, it was crazy in the sense that, it, you know, I actually took a weekend in the middle of August. I went to Bermuda, of all things, because the season, nothing was happening. <laughs> right. So on a personal, I said, well, personal note, I said, if nothing's happening, I'm just going to go on vacation. And of course, everything started to happen. That's right. September from, 1st. from that and, and things yeah. that cranking uh, in a hurry. If we can go back to that graphic here in just a moment uh, to talk about the average versus the actual. Again, looking at that, pretty spot on. Now guys, keep in mind, this comes from a place where we were geared up in our preseason preparations and our messaging of, of getting ready for the season ahead. And that came in tandem with these numbers, guys. These were the preseason forecasts from NOAA and Colorado State, which were certainly signaling to us that we were going to have potentially a whale of a season. And John, you know, you use a term as we were watching this sort of unfold over the last six months of recency bias. The idea that it's been so bad for so long that we were almost shocked that it wasn't as bad as it was supposed to be, right? Yeah. Because we're so used to these very active seasons. Yeah, especially when the season was forecast to be so active because of the ongoing La Nina. But a couple of things happened. You know, we had a lot of uh, uh, waviness in the jet stream that allowed for dry air from the mid latitudes to dive into the deep tropics. That dry air basically curtailed the development of, of a lot of the storms out there. Also, it was weird. Sea surface temperatures were super hot in the northern latitudes, but just, you know, not so hot in the deep tropics. In addition to that, we had a lot of wind shear, which is not normal for a La Nina year, but that was another factor which led to the slow start to the season. I just don't think that, that we need to, to shy away from giving um, attention to these seasonal forecasts because folks who say they're useless, and there's a very small body of folks that believe that, I think they're always beneficial giving us some snapshot of what folks who do that, who specialize in that climatology, that snapshot to, to let the general public know what we're thinking for the season ahead. But my most, the thing that I like the best about the seasonal forecast, it gets us in the frame of mind that the season is coming and that we need to prepare, to get prepared and to be ready. Because if we have not learned this going back since 2016, if you're a resident of Florida, living here involves preparing and dealing with every hurricane season. Well, we wanted to take a deeper dive into hurricanes, their strength, and the all-important role that climate plays. Take a look. The last eight years have been Earth's hottest eight years in human history. A warmer planet means a warmer ocean. A warmer ocean means that once a storm forms, it is more likely to intensify into a major hurricane. And when a major hurricane makes landfall, the devastation will be historic. 
Hurricanes are retired for one of three reasons, massive amounts of death, massive amounts of damage, or the storm is meteorologically historic. And Ian checked all three of these boxes, which is why there is simply no doubt that Ian will be retired after this year and will never appear on another hurricane list. Since 1954, there have been 94 retired storms, but incredibly, 37 of those have happened since 1998, considered by many to be the turning point in global warming. 1998 was the hottest year on record at that time, and now doesn't even fall into the top 10. Over the last six hurricane seasons, the list of historic storms has exploded. In 2017, when Harvey made landfall on the coast of Texas, it dumped more rain than any storm in U.S. history. And long before Irma made it to South Florida, it became the strongest storm in the Atlantic Basin. That record would be broken two years later with Dorian. Maria was one of the fastest growing storms ever, and we all know what it did to Puerto Rico. And Nate was the worst natural disaster to ever hit Costa Rica. The following year, 2018, Florence dumped more rain on the Carolinas than any storm in U.S. history, and Michael was the worst storm to ever hit the panhandle. In 2019, Dorian becomes the strongest storm ever in the Atlantic and the worst storm to ever hit the Bahamas. In 2020, Laura becomes the strongest storm to ever make landfall on the coast of Louisiana, and then in November, Ada and Iota, two major hurricanes that has never happened before. And then 2021, probably the storm that is the perfect climate change fuel storm. First with historic winds at landfall on the Gulf Coast, and then a storm that transitions into one of the worst rainstorms parts of the Northeast United States have ever seen. All right, Steve, thank you. One of the worst storms to ever hit the Sunshine State was Hurricane Ian. The storm brought unimaginable destruction and devastation to the southwest coast of Florida. NBC6's Ari Odzer is joining us this afternoon from Bonita Springs in Southern Lee County, one of the hardest hit areas there. Ari, it's been several months. You've made the journey over there today. Talk about what you're seeing. Well, Ryan, this is a perfect example of how just because the TV cameras are gone, and the hurricane damage is no longer on the front page of the newspapers. It doesn't mean everything's back to normal. Far from it here in Bonita Beach, where I'm standing right now. You can see behind me there's a big mound of debris still being moved. There was a bobcat over here working a minute ago, pushing all this debris towards the road to be picked up. As Steve Payne over here pans over to the left, you'll see a restaurant over here that's still gutted. Of course, it's built up to absorb a storm surge, but still not back in business yet because they haven't cleaned up. They haven't been able to get everything rebuilt. The storm surge just pummeled this area. We spoke to some residents who, a couple of them we spoke to, by the way, two months ago, about what's their, what their lives have been like since this happened, dealing with insurance companies, trying to rebuild, trying to clean up their homes. Take a listen to some of the things we just heard. This is what my house looks like right now. It's, it's just, uh, everything's been gutted, and um, we can't afford to do anything else right now, but it's at least the, the mold's not gonna grow. So that's where we're at here. It's too much. And then you know I'm gonna be strong. Today I'm gonna be positive. And then what? Unbelievable. It's just too much, it's too much. You know, the salt water kills everything. So we've kept some stuff that we could rehab or whatever, but that's it, yeah. So you pretty much lost everything? Yep, everything, everything. Yep. Do you feel fortunate that you got out safely? You're alive. Oh my God, definitely. <laughs> we're, we're blessed in that, in that area. How hard has it been dealing with the insurance companies? Impossible. It's phone call after phone call every single day, 20 phone calls, 30 phone calls, you get nowhere. Working on it, your file's being worked on. Understandably though, there are thousands of people that have been devastated, just like me. It's been a nightmare with the exception of the total strangers with the kindest hearts. And a lot of people are st starting to think that it's, it's over with. But there's still many people without electricity, without plumbing, no stove to cook on, they're still hungry. And so we're just trying to make sure everybody gets fed. All right, Ari, uh, now we're back live. I, I do have to say, though, the, uh, just down the road there, the Doc's Beach House, Spectacular place to get a burger. I'm going to take you there once they do reopen. But do you get the sense of the folks that in Bonita Springs, away from Fort Myers Beach, which really uh, was the epicenter of this and that got all the media t attention, 
do you feel the folks there are, are feeling very stoic and, and resilient and they're ready to move forward or do you sense that they feel left behind in, the, in this uh, rebuilding process? I think it's a little bit of both, Ryan. And, and by the way, let me just say something about the last man you saw there who was speaking about feeding people. He's a volunteer, part of an all-volunteer effort that has literally set up a tent in the neighborhood where we are at, and they're feeding people every day. He said literally hundreds of people who live in the area are coming by to get lunches and dinners. Everything is donated. Everything is volunteer driven and they're just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts to help their fellow community. And and you asked about whether or not they feel left behind. Well, obviously, people are resilient, right? They're they're moving forward. They're trying to clean up their homes or doing what they can. But I heard from more than one person today that everybody talks about Fort Myers Beach. Nobody has mentioned Bonita Springs except for you, meaning us, a story we did two months ago, you know, and, and because it's kind of overshadowed by the greater damage just up the road as you go further north on the coast. But this area was completely wiped out, as you can see all around me, and there's still a lot of cleanup and a lot of recovery left to go. A lot of issues with insurance companies that people are having. Imagine going through that, right? You're trying to rebuild your home, trying to physically clean up. Then you got to deal with insurance companies and you're getting nowhere. Just a complete disaster, a complete nightmare for these people. All right, Ari Odds are an important story to tell. Live in Bonita Springs this afternoon for us. Thank you, Ari. John? Well, thanks, Ryan. Following Ian, a lot of questions came up regarding the cone of concern. Is it time to change the cone of concern? Here's meteorologist Adam Berg. So maybe we do need to rethink the cone. Sometimes it confuses people more than it helps people. The cone is there to basically help predict the probability of where the center of a tropical cyclone is going to go, where landfall has the highest probability, but things can go wrong. More on that in a moment. Hurricane Ian's a perfect example of where things went wrong for many people. It became a hurricane Monday, September 26th, 5 a.m. Then within a 24 hour period, rapid intensification makes the landfall western tip of Cuba. It's now a category three storm surge, heavy rain, strong winds. We're getting the trifecta here. Additional strengthening. Now we're almost talking category five status in the next 24 hour period, just two miles per hour shy of category five status. 157 and above would make it cap five. It's a very large system as well, which makes it even trickier. So you can have impacts far outside the cone. And as these systems get a little bit closer, the cone shrinks as probability goes up. But here's the rub with that. It makes landfall as a 150 mile per hour hurricane, fourth strongest to make landfall uh, in, in Florida. And it's a very large system. The ocean floor is not very deep here, right? So shallow water, this all makes the storm surge even worse than it otherwise would be. Large system, uh, very shallow water. Storm surge, 10 to 12 feet here near Fort Myers Beach. Water mark showing maybe 15 feet. Storm surge up to seven feet as far south as Everglades City, Marco Island. Reverse storm surge, Tampa, St. Petersburg. Ocean's coming out. You don't have any issues with storm surge there. So all the loss of life is near and south of the system, outside of the cone for many folks. So it just adds to the confusion. Maybe we need an impact scale that's based more on your location. If that were the case, maybe Tampa's a two, St. Peter is a three, and then fours and five as you get closer to Fort Myers, but then you have fours and fives that go well south of Everglades City. It's tricky and it's location based, and maybe we can do a better job uh, in the industry of getting that message out.